Yes, here we are. Just when you thought the names couldn't get any bigger, we're only going to get David Moyes. Thanks very much for coming on, David. Thank you. Back in my home city now. Enjoying Thank it? You. Loving it. Look. Yeah, Beautiful. Yeah. Looking you over get it. that and so say that there. Oh no! Wait a minute! You're talking about the wrong place. Oh, you can't compare point, Glasgow with Sociedad. Start again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sociedad, Sociedad is the business. Lovely bays, beautiful place, the best food and wine. So, I shouldn't really be saying it in case all the all the everybody starts going there for yeah, the holidays. They've now. not got they've not got the baris, though, have they? They've not got what? The baris. They've not got the baris, but I'll t- let me tell you, they've got pinchos there. The food and the drink. Better than, the, better than the wine here, Straight I'll after this, me and you're over at Associated after the weekend, fancy it. <laughs> now, I always get nervous when I'm sitting down with my managers because I usually get the least at the end. So I'm just waiting on you telling me that Hazel Irvin's out there going to replace us. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to talk to you about how you started. I knew you were a big Scotland fan, I've heard, and your, um, your dad used to organise uh, journeys over to watch Scotland. Ah, we did. We used to go to Wembley every year. And we used to know far from where we were sitting today. We used to... My dad was a teacher at Annie's Land College and he used to run the used to run the college team and they used to all go go by coaches down to Wembley. So I was through the years I was only a young boy. You know, I was a wee boy who was going down there travelling the coaches and and you know, my memories were everybody was coming up. They all were carrying a case of lager, like that, a case of tenants. Sometimes you no know, twenty four in the case and maybe two cases. You could see them struggling to go in the bus and there was no room up the middle of the bus. And remember in those days there were no toilets in the bus. So we used to be going to Wembley with everybody on the buses. And it, we had great times going to Wembley as Scotland supporters. And uh, as I said, I was a wee boy. And we used to just uh, go to the rooms down at, at, in the hotels in London. And there was two of, the, two of the boys would be booking in. And there was another four years waiting outside. So we waited till we get in and then the other Still four. Jumping. So we were all to the mattress off the bed. There was two in the bed. There was two in the mattress and the four, you know, it was empty. So we had great days in the young days. And we... And, uh, I had, had some great times and I've got to say, you know, my dad, they run the buses to, to Wembley nearly every year when we went. And was your dad a big influence on you, a big football guy? Ah, he is, because, it, you know, people know who, who, for this part of the world, he, he was a, one of the, the managers of Drumchapel Amateurs, who, Drumchapel Amateurs at that time in Glasgow were probably one of the biggest boys clubs it, and probably Celtic Boys Club and the likes of Easter Craigs and a few others were, were all the big teams then. So when I was a young boy, I used to go and, I used to go with my dad to the game. So I actually think that the influence I had as a young boy came from, you know, I'd, I'd go with my dad, he was taking the college team in the morning, and then in the afternoon I'd go when he was taking from Chapel Amateurs in the afternoon. So, you know, I'd go and I was picking up the strips and, you know, and putting out the clean ones before the game for the players. So I think my, I think a lot of my influence as a young boy was really sort of following my dad who was who was just managing boys teams and, and college teams. Uh, was that work ethic? Did that rub off on you as well? Because I heard you're a uh, 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 I, th- I think it probably did. I think it probably came back that I think really running clubs and being, I think more importantly, I think you, you become a leader and you understand how things run. <clears throat> and I think people who do run boys football teams put in so much work and so much effort with, with no reward really. You know, they're not, they're not getting paid for it. And you could hear them on the Thursday night booking the referee, you know, making sure the pitch was booked, who was putting up the nets, have we got corner flags, you know, were the strips all washed for the game? So they were the days when that was, and actually at that time my mum would wash the strips and the strips would be hanging up in the line or sort of Sunday, Monday at the back in the, in the garden and stuff like that. So I think to run a, to run a boys team, you know, it took a lot of effort. Uh, as I said, we, we no real reward except to see how well the boys were doing and, and hopefully them all going on to get a career in football if they could do. Uh-huh. And you started in Iceland, not the supermarket, but the country. Uh-huh. Nah. How did that come about? <laughs> no, I didn't start in Iceland. That's an, you're, you're, Is that a myth? I've not done my research. You're, not doing, your, you're, doing, these, uh-huh. you're doing no homework. Everybody <laughs> does it. I think it's out in some report that I went and played in Iceland. Never. But what I did do, because, uh, again, my family had quite a lot of contacts in Iceland. Again, a bit with my dad taking teams out to Iceland. I went out and done some coaching when I was about 16 out there with, with young kids and, and actually it was in the Westman Island which is actually a wee island just off off uh, Iceland itself and uh, you know and I, I went out there and I think folks said that I played for them I never played for them so it's a myth some well, that's so, an exclusive so you've just, done, done, you've just done no I no knew homework. it wasn't true but I was just no, setting you up to check, tell everyone check, that no, it isn't aye, true aye, good, good. <laughs> so you played for Drumchapel Amateur still? No, I played for Celtic Boys Club. Right. Uh, I, I was with Celtic Boys Club from, from I was uh, about 12, and uh, and it was brilliant because, I, you know, it was great, and we had great times travelling up to Barrafield. For, because we were, for, you know, we lived in Bears Den then, so we were travelling up to Barrafield for, you know, a couple of times a week, and then playing, obviously, on a Saturday as well. But 
great times. So 16, 17, Celtic proper team came yeah, into you? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I'll, a friend of ours who we know, Jim McAnally, I went to Notts Forest with... Do you remember Scott McGarvey? Scott McGarvey... Oh, you must know I'm Scott. Scott, Scott, yeah. Scott McGarvey, know 40, Scott McGarvey was, was, a, was a centre-forward sign for Manchester United and played for Manchester United as well. Scott played for Easter Craigs, I played for Celtic Boys Club. At, at 15, we both went to Notts Forest together. Notts Forest were the champions of England at the time, so we're doing in trial at Notts Forest. But anyway, the reason I'm, I'm coming back to the story is because I came back and, and, uh, and I, I signed for Celtic, an S form for Celtic. Scott McGarvey signed an S form for Man United. None of his, none of his went to Notts Forest at the time. But we, I signed for Celtic, and then when I was about probably 17, actually I became, I went straight in and became a, a pro right away at Celtic. So that was really how it started. What was the, a pro like they did? Uh, is it the bits or not in there? Uh, no, well, I, because I, at that time you were only allowed maybe, I think, six apprentices. So I didn't become an apprentice. Uh, I went straight. I stayed on for about six months longer at school and then I never, I never really, not that I wasn't lighting it, but I, I got called up a Celtic to go right in. So I went in and and, uh, and that was it. So I went really right in to becoming a pro, but I was only I was only a young boy, you know, I was only training with the reserves every day, that was all it was. A good laugh though, being in there with young guys. Oh, we had, we had a brilliant, at Celtic it was great, but Celtic had, at that time, we had, you know, Celtic couldn't, at that time, couldn't lose to MD. I mean, if we if we lost a game, it was like murder, honestly. We were we were getting, you know, if the reserves lost, if the youth team lost, you know, if the first team lost, there was murder on in the building, you know. And I, I think in a way that, for me, that sort of installed in me, I think, really young about... And folks say, you know, what's your philosophy? What's your style? Well, oh, I'm telling you, my philosophy is to win. That's what I do, you know. Style's important to me. I like it to be good. But more importantly for me, I want, I want to win. I want to win more than... More. For me, that overrides anything. So, but I think that was all inbr inbred, really, for me from Celtic when, you know, every time, you know... And we used to be playing games, you know. We had a game every week. We were either playing Clyde Reserves or we were playing, you know, or we were playing Queen's Park. I don't know how many times we went to play Eddie Hunter's team at Queen's Park. We were playing Clyde. We were we were out to play in Hamilton or wherever. We were on the Ash Park at Hamilton when it was just done. We were playing games all the time at Celtic. And uh, and it was it was good. Do you think that winning thing's kind of gone for kids now? We don't have that anymore? I, I think it's something which, uh, I think sometimes maybe... The way, the way you young ones are, you know, you're all wanting it done with a bit of style, you're all wanting something as else can, done, as, as you as can, can tell, see yeah. with your gear, yeah. <laughs> uh, but overall, you know, I, th I think, no, I, look, I think the real managers are real winners uh, and the real top-end ones can do it with style as well. So who were the older players in that Celtic team that oh. kind of took you under the wing or showed you how Danny, to... Danny McGrain was probably... was Some probably man, was the, Danny McGrain was, was probably the, well, certainly the finest player I've ever... I've ever Played with and uh, and also a brilliant man and and uh, Tommy Burns as well. Tommy Burns was was fantastic at that time. But you no, know, we had we had so many characters. That, you know, Celtic was a team full of internationals. It could be Murdo, it could be Davy Proven, it was Charlie, it was George McCluskey, it was Frank McAvenny, You know, with Tom McAdam, with Big Roy. You know, I could go on and on about the players at Celtic at that time. And that's why I I when I go back really and, and say. I think all those people helped shape me into becoming what I was because I always wanted to be as good as them. I always wanted to try and I was, I was really dedicated to my, to my game. I was dedicated to be a really good player and trying to get better all the time. And I think seeing how good they were, they were, they were top players. You mentioned Billy McNeil. Jimmy Mack told me you were his favourite and really took you under his wing. Would you go along with that? Eh, I don't know if I would say he was his favourite, but I would say that he was good for me. I liked I liked Billy. And probably the minute Billy Meal left Celtic, it probably it became harder for me. You know, I was always up against it because I was I was a decent player. I was a good player, but not no. I would need to be. I'd need to to have played at Celtic. I'd have needed to imp keep improving. You know, but to be fair, Big Billy was always supportive and you know gave me my debut and and gave me opportunities to play. And I think at that time I, I was progressing. But I've got to say, Celtic had great young players. You mm. know. Through Celtic yeah. Boys Club, oh, Paul McStay was a was a brilliant player. Did you tell us back then that he was going to be a star? Uh, Paul was. We were we were probably playing under 16s, and Paul was stepping up grades. You no know, when he was 14 and 15 all the time, and and but the, the more important thing, Paul was a great boy as well. You know, he, Paul had no edge to him, no no ego. 
but you know, with Peter Grant behind us, Paul McGugan, we had we had lots of boys who, you know, and then above us was just the likes of Danny Crary and Willie and and Charlie and Mark Reed. So we had a group, of, a lot of good players just above us as well. There just seemed to be a sort of conveyor belt of boys who went into Celtic's first team all the time. There would be two or three boys who who you would try and get into the team. Mm -hmm. One name I want to ask you about is Johnny Doyle. Doyle, yeah. Funny. Doyle was an incredible man. He used to. He used to terrorise the reserves. He'd come into the, and we're, we're all scared of him. You know, we're all scared of Doyle. And uh, but Doyle was one of the ones who would, was a bit different. He didn't keep himself aloof like any of the, the first team. Always would come into the reserve team dressing room, burst in every morning. And you know, and he used to, he used to battle the boys. He used to punch them in the ribs. And he, you know, he used to make all the other boys who were the Rangers supporters sing sing Celtic songs and that. <laughs> no, no, he was he was mad. He really was doily, and and uh, he was, uh, uh, but he was a he was a great guy. And he, you know, he was a he'd look after the boys as well, and and he was just a, but he was a he was a right good Celtic man, a really good good player as well at the time. So you said then Billy left. You kind of felt yourself slowing down a bit. Of like, so was it a wrench yeah. to leave or? Oh, it wasn't a wrench to leave because I was, you know, in those days, the big thing was to play. Not like now where you see so many of the boys saying, I'm happy to be no number 23 in the squad in, in, in a jersey and what. No. A Gucci wash bag. If you, uh, if, you, if, you, if you weren't making the, the 11, you know, regular or if you were only being sub, you, you said, well, I've got to go and play. So I left and actually <clears throat> I was going to go to Wolves at the time. And Wills, and I can, I'll tell you a story in a minute or two, which you'll, you'll enjoy, hopefully. Yes. Wills, uh, Wills came up to watch me, and Wills at that time, I think, probably in the, the top division, I think, and actually they ended up signing Danny Craney. So Danny Craney got the job. They came up to watch Celtic Reserves, and at that time, the Reserves would play on the Saturday, just like the first team would play on the Saturday, and we'd play on the Saturday. That was the way it worked. So they come up, and they, they ended up, they never signed me, they signed Danny Craney, and I knew they were coming up to watch me. But Charlie had gone to Arsenal, and I got a call from Arsenal to say, would I go to Arsenal? I thought, yeah, you're right, this is this is the one. And and, um, and it was Terry Neal phoned me. Terry Neal was the manager of Arsenal. He says, we come? I says, yeah, definitely, you know. So then, and Davy Hay was the manager at Celtic at this time. And then I got a call from Don Howe. Don Howe says, look, we've decided, David, we're going to, we're going to take you in loan instead of you coming uh, full time. I says, I says, no, I says, I'm, I, I want to come full time. I don't want to come in loan. At that time, loan wasn't that, that used that often at the time. So I end up don't go to Arsenal on loan because I don't want to. And, and Charlie had gone in. I think Charlie had been, been a big influence at the time in saying that they should, they should take me. I get an offer at that time. Then they go to Sunderland, who was uh, Alan Durbin was the manager. And they were in the, pre the equivalent of the Premier League. You know, it was a, the first division then. And uh, Ian Monroe was the assistant. And actually, Ian Monroe was a player and assistant. So they'd phone me and said, would you come on loan? I says... Look, I've just said no to Arsenal on loan. I'm not going to go. To, I'm not going to come to Sunderland on loan. So I've just said no. So you're going to then. You're probably all going to fall off your seat when I say this. So I end up signing for Cambridge United. And you think to yourself, how did you do that? <laughs> you know, and everybody say, how did you do? How did you end up getting to Cambridge United from uh -huh. from when you were maybe talking about Arsenal and Sunderland and that? Cambridge were in the Championship or the equivalent of the Championship, and uh, I end up signing for Cambridge United with Celtic for a bit. Ten thousand pound or something I get transferred for, and it was a strange move, but a good. I'm going to say a good move because I played every week. We get relegated. Your trade probably, huh? I, we we get played played every week. Get relegated every year, so <laughs> and 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 and, uh, and 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 sort of learn learn and ended up. You know, and I've ended up. I think I've had about six hundred appearances or some six hundred games, but mm. partly it probably meant me going to a level, which meant that I was going to going to play so so going back to really where you started is I wanted to play mm -hmm. would Davey Hay not advise you at all you should go to Arsenal you should, would that not happen no Davey Hay actually advised me I remember saying no I shouldn't go to Arsenal he says it might not suit you you know <laughs> 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 so I think when I think back in that you know but look at the time I've got see when I look back in football I'm a manager now managers have to do what they think is right for their club and do business so I've got no problems with, with any of the managers making the decisions what they, what they had to do and you said 600 appearances proud of your playing career yeah, do you think you could have done better? Yeah, I think I, I think I could I think I've could have, I could have played higher. I always wanted to be a Scottish international. I played for Scotland under 18s and I never at that time Scotland did brilliant centre halves. 
know, you could, uh, before our time was maybe Gordon McQueen and even just Alan Hansen and you could go on. But then you then you were going into Hegarty and Neri, not to, not to think about even Goff and, wow. and all the ones that were coming on. So to be a Scotland centre-half at that time was really difficult. So I always wanted to play for Scotland, but... Uh, Never quite made it. You love the old Scotland there. People don't know, but you actually paid your own way to France 98. Is that true? Ah, we did, aye. Yeah, we, we, I paid my way to 98. France 98, I went because I was... I was by that time, I was, a, I was... I'm saying I was a coach. I was a qualified coach. I was managing. And did he... No, folks think that you had loads of money. No, I never I haven't. I earned £300 a, a week nearly all my career. So folks think that you had loads of money. Never had loads of money. You know, you mm. you didn't. So to folks think you, you might earn a bit more than what maybe somebody being being a joiner was or maybe somebody else, but you weren't you weren't earning fortunes like where the, the world of football's gone to today. So so it was tough. So I went to I remember I wrote to all the countries to see who would let me in to watch the training. I wrote to all the countries, couldn't I uh, get no reply. The only country who replied to me was Craig Brown, the Scotland manager, says, Yeah, you can come and watch us training. We're training in Avignon in the Scotland were based in Avignon. So I ended up going and sitting and watching Scotland training for a couple of days at Avignon. But uh, I'll tell you what did happen is I hired a wee car. I didn't have a lot. I didn't have a great deal. And I remember I slept in the car a lot of the nights, you know. Because did you, huh? I slept in the car in the car parts in France underneath. And, and uh, But the good thing was that Craig got me tickets for games like in Montpellier and Marseille and I went to the games. So lucky they got me tickets as well. So you know, there's a lot, a lot of people really helped me, to be fair. At that time when I was a player, the PFA really helped me. The PFA would help me, you know, get a bit of money to get flights because I was trying to improve myself and go out. And so, mm-hmm. so a lot of things along the, the journey where, you know, you think you get there and it's dead easy, but no. Nah, but also, I think when I look back, I put in a lot of hours myself to try and, oh, yeah. try and improve, you know. Was that a good Scotland team when you watched them? How was training? Was that a good Aye, good it was, but, you know, I'd done all my coaching badges in Scotland and done all the work and had seen, like, Craig Brown work and Jockey Scott and... Andy Roxburgh, who was a great coach, and all the people about that that era. So really going to watch them, wasn't he really? I was hoping to go and see maybe Italy train or, or Germany or something like that at the time, but I never got that. Did you see Craig Brown on a night out? Yeah. You know, Craig's got great reputation. He's, he's uh, you know, he's even impressed when he came as a manager late. He's got great history, I've got to say. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> was it later on in your playing career that you decided you wanted to be a coach, or was it quite early? No, it was early. I I think, look, I don't know who, I, I think I probably qualified as one of the youngest ever coaches, but do you know when we, going back to our days at Celtic, we used to get sent to, to Largs to be runners, which meant that coaching courses were on and, and what you had was, they sent down maybe boys for Celtic or Rangers or Aberdeen or Dundee United to be, to be runners to help the coaches. I was sent every year to Largs. I was like, I think I was, I think I must have just thought I sent him down. I, but I loved it, you know. And you'd done every job, you no, know, maybe you'd be an overlapping fullback, maybe you would be a midfield player, maybe you're a centre half, maybe you're a forward, and you were you were a twin striker. So and all the coaches were putting on the sessions and I loved it. And I loved it. More importantly, what folk will tell you, the history of Largs is incredible. What the nights out were like in Largs were incredible. Who'd be the main man for the nights out? Uh, well, I was only a young boy. I was I was looking up, but the history, you know, you've got to say, Alex Ferguson was a regular, Walter Smith were regulars, you know, Andy Roxburgh, you know, Jim McLean was down at times, you know, Craig Brown, you know, the, co- the coaching system in Scotland at that time, the time and the effort the coaches put in to develop the young coaches, there's nowhere else that has done that. You look now in the coaches' courses, you don't get, the, you don't get that level of managers or coaches putting the time and effort they were putting in to develop the coaches of today. And I, that's why... It's a longer story at the end of my journey now where I, I want to give a lot more back and try and help and, and do that. But all I wanted to do was sit and listen to them, what they were talking about football, the things they were talking about football. And you know the other thing? I wanted them to look and say that they thought I was quite a good player. And a bit like I was saying, I was always trying to develop myself and try to become a better player. So the managers would come to uh, coaching courses while they were taking the big jobs and they were Aye. still taking their time out to do that. Aye. Inspirational, isn't it, really? Uh-huh. Why do you think they came to the coaching courses to do it? I don't know. I'm stupid, don't ask me oh, questions, that's why I asked the question. Because Largs was legendary, the night suit in Largs at oh, that time. Has <laughs> <laughs> Largs got nightclubs in that, is it? <laughs> they did at that time. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, right, we'll skip to Preston North End. Uh, right. You take that job, would you have took any job at that stage? No. I know you were a coach no, at that to start I'd, with. I'd been getting offered jobs, uh, and look it sounds, I've been getting offered jobs since I was about 28. 
you know, and I'll tell you what I got is, I done my, I, I qualified as a full, fully qualified coach in Scotland when I was, I don't know, 21, 22. And I'd, I was playing in England at this time, you know, I was at, I'd moved to Bristol City probably by now, which was a great club and I, and I loved it at Bristol City. And I thought, my goodness, I wonder if they don't recognise it. So then I went and done my coaching badges all again in England. And you don't need to do them because once you're qualified, once you're qualified, it's a bit like when you get a, a degree and you'll get a degree in whatever you got. I went and done all my coaching badges again in England, the whole, the whole, the whole Buddha back in England. How come? Because I just worried that maybe... You know, folk would think, ah, oh, the Scottish ones weren't that good. So I went and done the English ones as well. And let me tell you, the Scottish ones were miles better than the English ones. What, what so, nights were better? Uh, off. Uh, hey, no, let me tell you, there isn't anything could could have beaten Largs in those days. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you took the team out of releg relegation ball in Division 2. What did you go on and change that was that would that would been done previously? Well, it was probably one of the, the biggest asked questions at those time was to say, uh, what was it like changing from being a player to a manager? Because... I had been a coach, I was a player coach, I was a player, then I was a player coach, then I was a player assistant, and then I got the job. And it was really all the players, and everywhere you go, folks, how was it changing? I actually found it easy because I knew what the players needed, I knew what they wanted. When I say I found it easy, when you look at, I got offered the job at Preston, but at that time, Preston were talking to, talking about getting Ian Rush's manager or Joe Royal as manager. Wow. And you know, and I was only, I was only Davey Moy playing, you know, hadn't, really done so I actually says no look I'll take the job for to the end of the season let's see how it goes and actually I don't, I don't think I won I think I won a cup game and I never won for six games you know and, and uh, I wanted to make sure the supporters wanted me to be the manager because you know it's, there's nothing worse if they don't so I got the job and uh, to be fair the players I knew what the players wanted I knew it was needed and I was I was ready for it then I'd already been offered jobs and assistant jobs when I was 28, 29 at clubs, you know, so I was sort of ready for it when, when it came around. So you took it temporary charge, what made you decide to take it on full time? Because it was a, it was a, it was a job, you know, at that time it was a bit like, I think it, it was easier to probably take that type of job then than it was now, and actually, whatever you say, Preston were on the up a wee bit, we were, you know, Preston, we had, as a player, I had played at Wembley a couple of times, uh, got to play off finals, been promoted, so, the club at Preston were sort of every year sort of doing all right, whatever league they were in. And that happened and we, you know, eventually we get through a couple of divisions. Do you think you learn a lot in the lower leagues? Like, see these oh, managers are going to take big jobs straight away? Definitely. I keep thinking, this is, I think, I think you've got to earn your stripes. I think you've got to, go, I think you've got to do the job. I think you've got to take the teams. I think you've got to find out about going in the bus and you've got to find out about the travel and I think you've got to find out about your training and organisation and how it works and, you know, in the lower leagues and going to the grounds and, you know, just how you handle the players and actually signing the players in the lower leagues, etc. It's not, it's not always an easy thing. Well, who's harder to deal with, a lower league player or a superstar? It's a difficult it's a, question. It's a good question to It's it? a good question yes. for you, it's a good one. <laughs> uh, I'd probably say... Uh, Maybe the lower league player. I, I think the boys at the top end are really good pros and know exactly what they're supposed to do. So, I've seen, I've seen what, I've seen what good looks like and what good, good is. I think at the lower end, sometimes you know the players think that you know they're, they're better than what they are and they, sh they don't need to do this and they don't need to do that. They think that they think they're good pros. They think they're, they're living right, and you tend to find that they're not. Uh, Two thousand and one, you got that same squad in the playoffs of the Premier League. How did you get a massive change out of the plan? What's well, we had we'd man? we'd built up, we'd built a good team, and we'd get good players, and we'd bought a few boys. You know, even people like, you know, before us, we bought David Healy from Man United. Uh, you know, we had we'd bought a few. We had before that we had people like uh, Michael Appleton was was a midfield player who'd come from Man United as well. We had bought well, uh, John Mack and strange enough, he was from Man United. But what happened is we'd be, they'd all developed into good players as well, and we started to sell them on as well, and. But uh, we bought Graham Alexander from from Luton, and uh, so we 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 brought in and we built up a, a good team. But we lost to to Big Sam's Bolton at, at Cardiff. The final was at Cardiff. We lost to Big Sam's Bolton to go into the Premier League, which would have been a, amazing because you want to know Preston still to the day have never got to the Premier League, mm -hmm. and all the teams in at that time, you know, whether it had been Fulham or Blackburn or, or uh, Bolton. 
and they were the three teams that got promoted that year. Fulham was Tagana was the manager at Fulham. John Tagana. Yeah. Soonis was the manager at Blackburn, and uh, and Sam was the manager at Bolton. And I think it was the first time. I think those three teams stayed in the Premier League for something like eight years. So the standard that we had to get to get up was was really was really hard. But but we done a brilliant job. Had a great team and. But what happened is Man City came in and offered us five million for John Mackin after it. And it was just the start of the break up the team. Then I had started to get offers with Premier League teams and other clubs and and uh, and it I I'd, I'd sort of eventually you know, it was too too big to turn down when it. When is it, it a great buzz around. when you're taking a team through the leagues, isn't it? Oh, it's fantastic. Is it? As I go back to what I said right at the start, winning, you know. I, I don't care where you are. See when you're winning and you get a bit of momentum going for you and, and you get the feeling of that going, it's hard to beat because it carries you a long way, you know, and, and even you can shrug off a defeat quite quickly and the players know what, what's expected. So I think to be fair, through most of my early part of my career, I mean not early part, we were winning most weeks and even when I when the next part when it comes to Everton, you know, we were winning most weeks, which makes a big difference as a manager. Just before you went to Everton, what other clubs were, were sniffing about? Oh, honestly, I must have. I met loads of clubs. I met Sheffield Wednesday, who were in the Premier League. I met Southampton, who were in the Premier League. I met Notts Forest, who were in the Premier League. I'd, I'd loads of loads. Why of did you not take the, job, the jobs? A good stories. I went to, I met Sheffield Wednesday, and I thought, I don't know what I'm going to do. Who am I, who am I going to ask for advice? So I thought, I'll phone Sir Alex. And I said to Sir Alex, can I come and see you? He says, uh, I come into the office. So this is actually Carrington had just been open. So it was the first time I'd actually ever been in, in the office, which I eventually take over uh, years down the line. And I went into Sheffield. I, I went into Alex. I said to Alex, I says, uh, I've been offered the Sheffield Wednesday job. He says, what do you think? He says, nah, no good, that job. No good. I says, aye, OK. He says, and he went through the whole... Sheffield Wednesday squad, he knew everything. Wow. He went through uh, all the players. I actually think De Canio might have been a player. Uh, I, 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 he went through the squad at Sheffield Wednesday. And I thought, oh, he said no. Nah. He says, aye. And then I remember when he walked out, he says, but you've not got much yourself at Preston at the moment, have you? So I, I, walk, I, walked, out the, I walked out the room floored, you know. Uh, I met Rupert Lowe uh, about the Southampton job. And I flew to Monaco and I met Nottingham Forest. And I'm going to, it's going to, it feels to uh, sound terrible, I'm going to forget the name. It was the old, the, the ex chairman at Tottenham Hotspur and Notts Forest at the time, Irvin Scholar. I met Irvin Scholar, well done. See, he's. That was he, me, that was me. No, 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 you've, I got, told him you've that. got other people, you need the backup, <laughs> you need subs. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, Irvin Scholar, I met him to take the Notts Forest job. And, you know, at that time I was getting offered quite a lot of jobs. And then, uh, then it's probably well documented as well. Then, you know, Sir Alex had called me later on at, when I was uh, at Everton to to see if I was going to take the Man United job as a, as assistant manager. So different times, but at Preston it was mainly it was, they were the clubs that were getting getting mentioned. So what was it about Everton that that you thought this is the one? Uh, I remember there was a wee a wee Scottish guy who was, uh, and again I feel terrible. At, not just a wee Scotch guy, he was a director at Blackpool Football Club. I used to bump into him at games, I'd be watching him, and he used to say, Everton's a club for you, son. You wait in Everton. And uh, out the boy Everton came up, and you've got to remember, Walter Smith was the manager at Everton, Walter's my friend. Walter and Andy Roxburgh were my managers of the Scottish youth team at under 18. And uh, when I was played for Scottish under 18 team, so Walter was someone who I, I, I really highly respected. And uh, but Walter, they were having a tough time at, at Everton, and I got a call out the boy about Everton, and uh, that was it then. Did that not put you off a bit that Walter had a tough time there, knowing how good a manager aye, he was? Aye, but I think that at that time you weren't really so much fright. I wouldn't say frightened of the jobs. You were, you know, you were at it. You're saying, and it was the best. I mean, look, I'd been offered lots of other jobs which were probably better than Preston, but. I never really wanted to leave Preston because of what I was building at the time and, and how well the team and the club were going, and, and also. I'm pretty loyal, you know. I wanted to be loyal to to the people who had really supported me and backed me as well. So, but Everton job, Everton was one of the big six clubs in, in England, and I think when it came up, I couldn't say no to it. And what was your initial goals given to you, Bill Kenwright? What did he want? Uh, he only gave me. He says I can only give you five million a year to spend, David. 
And I went, aye, OK. He says, uh, I says, I tell you what, Bill, here's, what you do is you don't sell any of my players, Bill. He says, right. I says, and I can do anything I want with the players. I can take them anywhere I want. I can give them the best that everything I want. And he says, OK, we've got it. We shook a hand on that deal. And that was it because I believe that, you know, giving the players the best, preparing them right, you know, whether it be a trip, whether it be a hotel, I think always give your players the best. And I've sort of always followed, I always try to treat my players and, and give them the best of what I can. How important is that to set your stall up with a chairman early doors? Oh, massively important. But you couldn't do it nowadays because uh, it's slightly different. And actually, you know, you could eat five million at that time. Imagine you only have five million to spend. Couldn't even get me for five million, but no, no, that's right. You, 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 <laughs> you're the chance there. Right? <laughs> uh, so, uh, so that was that was the way it was, and and I took it on. And he says, look, any players you sell, you'll get the money back. You can get the money from the sales, you know, if, if you choose to sell them. So, he stuck to his word. I stuck to my word, and actually. If you look back at my 11 and a half years at Everton, you'd probably see that I think we were actually under the five million at the end of the, the, the 11 and a half years, which takes some doing. Brilliant. I've heard you say before, it's the people's club. Aye. What makes it, what makes it that? Because Faddy oh. said that exact same thing as well, it's just the people that are Aye. there. I remember I was driving, it was at, talking about when you're getting the job, you know, I got the job and they said, look, you're rushing in. They'd done a deal with, with Preston and uh, agreed the compensation where it was. And, uh, and he says, look, we want you in for a press conference Thursday night. And it, it was Thursday afternoon by this time. I was saying, oh, gee, what's that going So, uh, So my brother Kenny, who's always looked after me, I says, right, OK, we're driving to... And when we're driving into a Liverpool, and it's a bit like driving into Glasgow, or maybe driving into Glasgow years ago. And I was driving in, and it was a, it was a decent night, I remember. And uh, all, the, all, the, all the boys were out in the street, and girls as well, all out in the street. And, and they, all, they all had Everton shirts on. And they're all playing football on the streets, you know, and, oh, and yeah. it, a bit like what you used to sort of see Glasgow being that way, you know, I used to think that was the way it was, you know, we'd do, you'd be playing it off the curb or you'd be finding walls to play off or, or whatever at the time. And uh, they were all in the street and I'm saying, my goodness, what's this like here at all? You know, and it was, uh, you can through a lot of the council estates and the way in, the way, the way Kenny was driving me in anyway. And uh, I don't know where it came and I thought, hell, everybody, and, and actually what I really started was this is, all the people in the streets support Everton. So that's where it came, it stuck in my mind. I says, all the people in the street, and it used to be, and I think it is, because I'm an Evertonian really when it comes to, I says, all, the, uh, all those Liverpool supporters must live in Norway. I think they all live in Norway or Sweden, all Liverpool supporters, you know, none of them live in, none of them live in Liverpool because Everton and going through so. And that's what I saw, and I remember saying, I went and says, the people in the streets support, support Everton. It's the people's club. And actually, it was probably, I think, the thing that probably changed it and probably gave me a, a, a real projection, mm -hmm. you know? And, it's a matter uh, of words can just change. change how, how, how supporters see it. And, Not what and you what do on think. the pitch, but what you say. Sometimes it? what happens, and I think it gave me a real chance, and before you know it, you know, it, it get picked up, the media picked it up, the supporters picked it up. And uh, and look, to be fair, you know, like, and I'm, I, w I was up and coming and I was being successful in what I was doing as well, so... I think maybe in a way uh, Everton were glad to have me, but I was certainly glad to have them. The squad you inherited has Gaza and Ginola in it. Oh, what was your thoughts hell. on that? I turned up. Uh, and actually, you know, it, when you're a young manager, the things that go through your head and the, and the, the stuff you had, I says, I've got to go and I've got Ginola and I've got Gascoigne. Now, what was happening is I'd just left Preston on the Thursday. We were due to play Burnley on the Monday night in a televised game, and actually, that was a big derby and it was tight at the time when I was in Burnley. What I didn't know is, and I, I just, I'll just say this so for the, for you, is after I got offered the job on the, on the, I think it was a Wednesday night, I drove to, where, I drove to Walter, and I said to say, Walter, look Walter, I'm going to get offered the job, Walter just been sacked. So I went to Walter's house to ask him about Everton and talk to him about Everton, what he thought, and, to be fair, Walt was brilliant. He told me to take the job and that. So, but because I respected him so much and what he was, I went and saw him. So, but he also says to me, he says, "There's a deal on. Gaza's going to Burnley on. Gaza's going to Burnley on Friday." I says, "Oh shit!" I says, "I can't sell a player to Burnley what I was going to play against oh. on Preston <laughs> on the Monday." I says, "I can't do. It. I'll get. I'll never be back to, back to Preston again. Never mind. I'm giving Burnley a player." So Gaz is in to see me Friday morning right away. 
and, and Gaza's a guy, he was crying, and uh, he was saying, ah, I'm going to Burnley, I want to go to Burnley, stand ten and, and I says, Gaza, I can't let you go to Burnley. I says, you're going to play my old team, and I can't, you know, we were, you know, I'd have been playing against you, I can't, uh, saying, ah, oh, I want to go to Burnley. <laughs> so, I think somehow I managed to get the deal put off that we didn't get suited <laughs> for the game. So, and uh, David Genoa was there as well, and, and I had to deal with David Genoa as well, and, but you know some he was suave, he uh -huh. was, uh, cool, he wasn't was, he? no, if you were a bird you would fancy him, uh -huh. you know, you I'm would, a guy and I fancy him, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, but you don't uh, want him to keep uh, a hold of the two players, uh, given their quality now, you yeah, but, but you know something, I, I was a bit like, I'd already sort of said, I was changing the philosophy, when I got the job at Everton, and I spoke with the board and Bill Kenwright, I said, look, uh, I want to get young players, I want to get new, I want to get a hungry team, I want to get boys who are really going to pull out. And I actually thought that Everton had started to get themselves full of sort of old players and I, I thought Everton had bought players for a wee bit of a, a, a boost and I understand why, because they had no money. I was coming out of the lower leagues and I was full with knowledge of the players because I was at games all the time. I was watching. And folks say, you're going to games, what, you, I see David Moyes at all games, what you do. I'd done that because to build up my knowledge, but I love football, you know, I do that. I, but it's amazing, see when you go to see a game, sometimes you see somebody, you say, by the way, he's no bad, him, you know. And by that time, I had built up my knowledge of all the players in the lower leagues. And that's why in my head I had Tim Cahill, you know, and Andy Johnston in my mind, and all the players in the lower leagues who I thought, hey, they would do a job. And actually, that's what happened is, you know, and I ended up and I brought, and I was wanting to bring in a new, fresh, young team, really. But I had to inherit and play with the team, what I had, which had Duncan Ferguson, Tommy Gravison, uh, Pistone, Steve Watson, uh, Davey Weir, Alan Stubbs. Uh, we had a really good team. They were a really good team, what I had, in Genoa and Gascoigne. And uh, because of that, and I'm probably missing out some really top players, I'm saying that. So there was a good team there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, first thing first was to actually try and get, get some results with that team. Given the budget was so tight, how much did you take to do with transfers? Was everything you're saying? Aye. And that's changed now completely in football. Did you enjoy it better when it was like that? I think it was because, I, you know, I had to say, you know, I'd, I'd go to Bill and say, Bill, I can get this player for two million. Uh, you know, I'd like to buy him. No, it wasn't easy mm -hmm. because Bill done all the deals and Bill was really good at it. Bill Kenwright was very good at it. Done all the deals at that time. And uh, because of that, you know, we, we, we sort of built it up with, with not a lot of money. In your first year, you finished seven. Mm -hmm. What would you put that down to? Uh, desire for me because I, I, I was, I'm, I'm driven to sort of try and succeed. And again, back to that winning. You know, I wanted to win. And actually, I, I think when you, you're a young manager as well, you know, you're, you've got lots of energy, lots of, or you should have if you're a young manager. If you're not, then you shouldn't be in it. Uh, I was driven to sort of, make it work and get the best out of what I could and add one or two players to it as we went along and, and we did and, and you know it wasn't an easy journey but we, we upped everything and I think, it, I think it rubbed off a lot in the players at the time. See the older players that you talk about, can you, can you still make them better as a manager? I think you can, I think they, uh, do you know something, I think all players want to get better, I think all players want to be told, I think all players, I think all players want to be applauded. Did you ever get applauded as no, a player? Never, that's no, never. That's why I'm doing this. Uh, get, did you get the <laughs> boo? Yeah, yeah. I was a big boo. Uh, right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, what ha what happens is, is you get uh, you know all players want to be applauded. That's that's what I think. Nobody wants to be booed. I get booed a bit as a player at Celtic, you know, and it mm -hmm. and it can affect you. So, so is it confidence? Just giving them that confidence. I think so. And, and actually, so if your team's winning, you tend to find the crowd are cheering you and, and saying, "Hey, come on, you're doing all right." Mm -hmm. So it makes you feel good. So. Everybody wants to be on that journey and everybody wants to be winning. Brilliant. I want to ask you about the first time you've seen Wayne Rooney. The very first time you've seen him playing football. Uh, I saw him play, I was actually... Semi-final, semi-final, it could have been the final. I'd done it actually in the gantry for Goodison. I done it. I think I was doing it for Everton TV or something. And, and they were playing Tottenham in the semi-final, the final of the FA Youth Cup. And uh, there was, was this wee boy uh, playing and he was miles better than all the rest. It was a bit like 
coming to Glasgow on the pitch and you can see somebody who's just miles better than any other, other football and you go, oh, he's a, he's a good player and that. And, and actually that was a way you were, you were sort of brought up a wee bit in Glasgow. You know, you're brought up, you could see, you could tell the good players and, mm. and you, you knew the boys who could stand out for the others. Wayne stood out like a sore thumb in the game and they won, I think, he, I think he might have scored a hat-trick the night. So I remember the team were out, I was up in the gantry, so, and I finished the thing, and I remember walking down off the gantry and going down, and they were on the pitch, and I, was, I wasn't long the manager, I was maybe only, I'd maybe only be six weeks, but I've got to say, I remember the night I met Walter on the Wednesday night, Walter saying to me, I tell you what, there's a really good boy in the academy, his name's Wayne Rooney. So, you know, it's a bit like, aye, all right, boy in the academy, I might never see him, you know what I mean? I remember, what down off the gantry after the after the game, and they were doing a ball. I remember walking past and I said to the boy, he says, "I'm saying you'll be with me next year in the first team." This was to the young boy, but I knew we had to look after him a wee bit as well because I'd, I'd heard he was on the up. So, all behold, I called him up for the first team probably about three four weeks later because we played. He was on the bench if you look. He was on the bench at Southampton when he was still at school, and we had to ask the school to get him out. I don't know why. I don't know why I had to ask Wayne school to let him out. I don't know if Wayne was at school. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, but uh, I got I got Wayne out of school uh, because at that time you needed you needed uh, you needed them to to let him out. So we get Wayne out of school and he was on the bench at sixteen at Southampton before six, that. That was sixteen. I might have been fifteen. Wow. I don't know. Aye. Well, and was there a, was there a, a stage or something that happened in training where you thought right this kid's ready to play? Oh, well. So we we brought him up to the, we brought him up to the first team and you know and he was. And he was and he was about it, and he was a, he was a great boy, but he was also he was just he was also a, I mean, he was mental. Was he a way of doing it? No, we'd have all the I'd have all the training. I built him to have all the stuff all set up, you know, nicely planned. All the training drills, the balls would be on the pile there. He'd run out and volley a lot of them. Oh, he'd volley a lot, you know, thinking they'd be all over the pitch. And, I can, there's my staff away chasing and bringing back the balls oh, for right. Wayne. You know, he's only only sixteen, if you remember, but. Uh, a dunk, big Duncan took him under his wing. Whether that was that was a good <laughs> idea or not, and it, it wasn't one of Duncan's pigeons either. I've got to say, it was, it was a, a Duncan sort of looked after him and, and you know and made sure that he was right. But the boys, Alan Stubbs looked after him as well, and because they were with the same agent at, at the time. And but Wayne was Wayne was tough, and he, you know we used to like in the gym there. There was the old the boxing or the bag would be there and that. And, no, Wayne, Wayne would have said at the time, I'll take MD on with the gloves on. Would you, huh? Aye. That so bold, was he? He was that, that type, you know, and that's why he was a man at the time. So when we put him in, there wasn't any really any real problem about uh, him being, him sort of competing in that. It was just whether he was ready. But, you know, at the time, it's a bit like we all, as young players, you know, I was a centre-half at Celtic, but I played right back, you know, to start with, because it was sometimes the way if you were a centre half, you might have played it right back or left back to get in. You know, it's a bit like if you were a, a midfield player, you might have had to play off the sides a little exactly. bit. If you're a centre forward, maybe you had to play wide a bit. So Wayne was finding himself, you know, you know, having to maybe play off the sides and that. And I was getting dogs abuse from the media because at times, and if Wayne wasn't playing, because he'd already become the golden boy of, of England and, and sort of their great hope, really. So. It was a big job managing them. Is that hard when you're relatively new in your management career as well? Hi, and and you know I, I, all I could refer back to was Charlie Nicholas at Celtic, because Charlie was my pal, and you know we used to go out quite a lot together. He had all the gear, you know. I'd, I'd been, I'd, I was a big ginger boy. The gear's know. got better now. They've planned, I, I like the planned, isn't I, it? I, uh, uh, I was a big ginger haired boy. You know we. You know, Pots didn't look at big ginger haired boys, but Charlie was smooth and had all the gear, leather trousers and that. So, so I'd sort of known how it worked for Charlie, you know, and and, uh, and I used to pick him up at the barracks in Mary Hill. If Danny wasn't picking him up, I was picking him up, you know. We were a lace driver, and uh, so I'd sort of get, got, and I could only use Charlie as 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 an example of how you would sort of deal with someone because Charlie was a superstar, you know, at Celtic, and and I was getting another one. But Wayne was getting asked to do, I think, Pepsi adverts, Coke adverts, and I was going mad because I'm saying uh, I've got to look after him. I've got to, you know, my job's to make sure he's no flying down to London to do a, an advert for something. Or, and I was having it with his agent Paul Stretford at the time because I was banning it and saying no. So they probably didn't like me at the time, but I was doing it all for his benefit, benefit in the hope that, hope that Wayne would focus on the football. But 
it wasn't that Wayne was going to take his eye, eye off it because he was only just starting, but it was to make sure that, you no, know, I, was, I wasn't into all the other things connected to football at the time, you know, which the agents were doing to try and earn money through commercialisation. I wasn't into that at the time. Just to touch on something you said there, would you use, do that quite a lot, use your playing career and your management? Would mm. that come back, back yeah. to you when you're a manager? Uh, yeah, well, as I said, I think, my, I think you say, where did, where did your philosophies? So folks say about your football, your style. My style was based on what Celtic played like. Celtic had to play with a style, had to play with you no know, wingers, with Davy Proven, you know, had to attack. You no, know, you go back to Celtic in the heyday, you know, you had to attack, your, your part of it was to play good football. But you know, what Celtic won, what, what the punters wanted was, was you to win. And I told you the determination which came from within the players, the, the demands the top players have to win and be good was, uh, was probably, I think, where it sort of stuck with me. Where does Wayne rank in the players that you managed? Uh, ah, he would need to be... I think because he's easy to talk about and everybody knows him, it's easy to say ah, he's number one, but you know something? I get as much pleasure. We got Lee and Osman two caps for England when he was 31. He got capped for England, Lee and Osman, and he was a, he's a brilliant player. And a great, he's a great boy, but a great footballer. I probably took more pleasure out of Lee and Osman getting two caps for England. And we phone him up and call him one cap and all that. Now because he, But... We get as much pre pleasure for that. If you said to me, you know, look at Tim Cahill when we took him from Millwall, what happened to Tim Cahill and, you know, you know, and I, I, I think the teams I've had over the years, you know, we built them and folks think of where we were, you know, I look at David Weir and Alan Stubbs who were the centre-halves and Lee Carsley and, and the players we had to where we finished with Mikel Arteta and Stephen Pina, the, the way the teams evolved at Everton and I laugh at people now who say, uh, have you seen? Have you seen those? Those you know Everton in the style. Our style at Everton was fantastic. Oh yeah, we had great thing. players. Uh -huh. um, you said that Wayne Rooney was mad, but I'll hands down guarantee the maddest guy you've ever managed. He's a cult hero on the show, Tommy Gravison. Tommy Gravison, yeah. Is he the maddest guy you've managed? Uh, I've got to say he'd be right up there. He'd be right up there. But everybody used to get him mixed up with Lee Carsley. Uh -huh. <laughs> so when Real Madrid came in for him at, at uh, Everton, we were all saying. No, have they got the right one? Is it Carsley the one, or is it Tommy Gravin? Two ball, you know, the two baldies and and what not. But Tommy, Tommy was mental. Tommy was mental and and but in a good way. In uh, a good lovable. way, you know, he's a great player. He could hold you off. He could keep the ball off you, you know. And and we loved him. And but we couldn't believe so. You know, at that time, that year, I sold a player to Real Madrid and I sold a player to Man United. You know, so there's me going back to Bill Kenwright. Don't, you know, you can sell what you can get back and you can use the money, but, you know, and we're talking about where the players were, were moving on. Some of them were moving on to really top clubs. Uh -huh. was, he, was he hard to manage, so as in, would he not listen I, to No, no, he, would, he was on his own, you know, he wouldn't yeah. listen, but it wasn't, it wasn't in a bad way. Uh -huh. I think it was a wee bit where he... I didn't want to hear you, or he didn't hear you, or he just yeah. done his own thing. And but he was another one who was crazy in his training as well. And you know, you just never knew what we were going to get with Tommy. Did you ever hear a weird conversation on that with him? There, would he speak? Ah, he'd speak to him now and again. But ah, he was he was a good lad. You know, he was very polite and everything he done. He was never, but ah, he was mental. But if Andy says he shot fireworks at a physio one day, were you aware of that? No, they were in the gym, and it was the old gym at Belfield. And it was it was an old it was an old no not come the way it is now and but it was big it was maybe at that time about sixty yards long, and I think it was him and Wayne, and they were holding the fireworks at one end of the gym each other, and they were shooting the fireworks and actually we had a guy who used to come in, in Liverpool as you can imagine would sell his end you know and uh, and they had big rockets no big kind about that thick and that long you know full of gunpowder. And they were holding one end and shooting them at each other <laughs> through the roof. What was your reaction? What was your reaction? I'm that? the manager. I'm supposed to be the one who's saying, You're joining "Stop in. that, will you? <laughs> <laughs> will you stop that?" <laughs> but it was, you know, we just behave yourself. You know, you're like, they'd already done it. Brilliant. You know? yeah. Hey, by the way, Stubbsy was Stubbsy was right up there as well. well. Stubbsy's been on. He's, oh, he was brilliant. Stubbsy, uh -huh. was, Stubbsy, did he tell you about? They used to pour the water over everybody's head at, at Belfield. No. There was, a, there was a, a window at the door and then everybody used to walk in. So what would happen, you would shake people's hands in the way out and say goodbye. Everybody who came came to sign a lot, you know, stood at the door, stubs in that, they all had that big beer getting right <laughs> over the wall, you know. And then they'd all be away, you could hear them all. Not till they'll be back in the dining room sitting, nothing's happened, you know. So 
Uh, they had, uh, uh, they, there was a, a good team spirit, great spirit, and you know Stubbs, Stubbs he was Stubbs he was right up there as well. Don't uh-huh. don't be fooled. Another guy whose stories always get told about is Big Duncan Ferguson. How was he the first time you met him and you took over? Was he was he good to you? Was he hard work? Aye, I, I made him I made him captain right away, and actually it was tough because Davy Weir was captain. So a bit like going back to all the story where th- Wednesday meeting water getting the job Thursday first day Friday. One of the hardest things was that on the Friday. Friday after training, I, I pulled Davy Weir into the office. I, says, I said, Look, Davy, I says, I've just taken over. I'm looking for a reaction. If you don't mind, I'm going to make Duncan captain. And uh, and Davy was great, as you would expect. He says, Aye, no problem. I said, I'm going to try. So then I pulled Duncan up and I went, Duncan, I'm going to make you captain. He went, Right. And that was it and walked out. And I had been, I had been captain of nearly every team I'd been at, a bit of a leader probably, that was, that was my style and I think I'd been a pretty good one over the years and you know, was, I'd done everything I could and bit, you know, up and at them and we'll, you know, we'll get into them and all the, all the usual, you know. Oh, dear, you should have seen Duncan. Oh, when I get in my first game in the dressing room, it's a bit like, you know, everybody gets a, gets a new job and it, you never know where he's sitting at in a new job or wherever you go and how you come in and like that. So it's a bit like that even as a, as a football manager, you come in and where you go and where you stand and you know, where are you supposed to be. So I remember coming in and done what we had to do. The team was already picked and organised. Actually, it was Andy Holden had helped me pick the team on the Friday. And so really it was through there. So Donkey's captain, you should have heard him in the dressing room. My goodness. He had the whole lot pinned up against the wall. <laughs> he had the whole lot. Fucking blue boys, you better get this done if we don't ever. I was like, I thought I'd been good. I was like, oh, my <laughs> goodness, <laughs> what, what, what's going on here? It was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. And, you know, we scored after 29 seconds. David Unsworth scores the goal for me after 29 seconds in, my, in the, back in the Premier League, or, or in the Premier League for the first time. And Duncan gets the second goal and we, win, we beat Fulham 2-1. And that was actually Tigana's team who we had failed to sort of overturn in the, in the championship the year before. So uh, it was, it, so that was my sort of introduction to Duncan, you know, and, and he, was a, he was a cult hero. He really was. Does he only have that side to him or is there a, is there a softer side when being oh, captain? Would he, he help he guys was, as well? I'll tell you what, you know, we all, everybody has, has hospital visits and we do, I mean, a lot of things which go unnoticed in football by the players and what happens in charities and some people do great work. Duncan was probably the best I've ever seen with the kids in the in the hospitals. By a mile of all my in all my time in football, Duncan was brilliant with the kids. He went to the hospitals, he spoke with them, it was great, the kids all loved him. So I'd have to say he's got you know, he's got a soft side behind him as well, Duncan. Right. You gave me starting coaching. What did you see in him that that he done that? Or did he just say, ah, wait, did like, he just say I'm gonna be a It's a long story. We we and Duncan had big fallouts over the years, but I think if you look at Duncan's history, probably had big fallouts with all his managers know wherever he was, you know, whether it be Jim McLean or whether it be Sir Bobby Robson, I think that was Duncan's way a little bit. Uh, I think that was the way he played and the way he had to be managed. But uh, do you know some All the teams were frightened of him at that time in the Premier League. Nobody, you, none of them wanted to play against him because he was that good. He was that good. He was brilliant on the ball. He could take it in and he was incredible, aggressive and great in the air. But, uh, so we sort of had a bit of a fallout, but I brought him back in the end because, look, Life moves on and, and we brought him back and I thought, well, why would you not have Duncan in and around? He was a, at the club and he went and he took the young boys and we brought him in, gave him a bit of a job and he moved up and he moved up. And I think, I mean, mainly he's involved around the, around the first team now. Is it intimidating as a manager when you need to have a fall with a, bit, a big player? No, I think you just have to do your job. I don't think you, I think you have to, I think you treat everybody. I think even in those days, it's much different than where it is now. But I, I think it doesn't change. I think you treat everybody, as far as I'm concerned, the same. But there'll be others who maybe you have to you have to change a little bit. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, proud guys like Stubbs, Neville, Graham Alexander, James McFadden, David Weir, all going into coaching and management. Aye. That must have something to do with. Aye, there was a lot yourself. of them and, and lots of others as well who are around it and all trying to do it as well. So, no, I hope that I hope that they would. They pro- look, Phil Neville's a great example. Phil Neville as well, you know and. For all his thing came and came from Man United, became my captain at Everton for years and and was 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 magical in what he done and what he brought as well. And so there's a there's a young group as well who are all trying to get into it as well. So mm-hmm. so I'm hoping that the 
they're all successful and maybe as I'm getting older if they ever need a bit of help then I'll always be about yeah. I need to ask you about Faddy because he came on did you know he was scared of you? no Faddy was a wee Glasgow he was a wee, wee gallus didn't uh -huh. he? Faddy was gallus uh -huh. wasn't he? Uh -huh. Definitely. Faddy thought he was he was a wee gallus boy and that and came down you know and tried to be a wee bit of that so we soon had to try and you know, you know what he was he was a typical Glasgow he wanted to dribble and beat everybody every time we go he just wanted to go I'm going to dribble and beat everybody and, and if I lose it it doesn't matter you know and that was that was faddy you know but when you think about it that's a wee bit of what we are up here isn't it a bit gallus and fancy ourselves a wee bit but we always we always wanted to try and I always wanted to try and sign the best Scottish boys if I could because I wanted always to uh, Scottish players or Scottish players around the team if I could and uh, Faddy was good and, and, I, and I enjoyed him and I think we probably got Faddy maybe at the best time of his career because he was you know his goal he scored for Scotland against France if you remember when he scores the, the shot you know we had that and it was in the it was in the secretary's office a picture of Faddy and I think he's slightly off the ground in a shape you no know, he's shot with flies in it part of France you know so uh, uh, we were all quite proud of Faddy really in a way and, and, and uh, I'm more amazed that Faddy's now a coach. You know what I mean? <laughs> Go carry on, Faddy then. probably would have been saying to me, oh, no, we do, doing, we're not doing that, I'm dribbling and whatnot. But, but it's amazing how they all change. And uh, I met him the other week and it was great to see him. See, just on young players, promising players coming through, is it important to be really tough on them? Yeah, uh, I think it is. I think, I think you've got to shape them. I think later on, I think they'll all go back and say, I'm glad they've done it. Mm -hmm. I think there'll be others who might think, Look, you might say you've been freed that many times. You might say that you didn't like any of your managers and you don't think any of them helped you, you know. But I, I think in the main, I only want to win with my teams. I only want to put the best team out. And I hear, I hear people on the scene, you know, what is he playing him for? What is he doing that for? And I think to myself, is, do you not think I want to win every week? I say, my job's to win. I say, so I'm only ever going to play the best team, the best players. Yeah, I might have a reason why I don't think I should play this one instead of the other. There's no manager out there who's not trying to win, that's for mm -hmm. sure. 2004-2005, you were in a relegation battle the season before. You lose Wayne Rooney in the summer. Did you feel pressure going on? Not pressure. I'd, I, I've got to say, I'd great. Bill Kennedy was great. But we lose the last game of the season 5-0 uh, at Man City or 5-1 at Man City. But if you, look, if you look through the history of Everton, Everton would always get themselves safe at Easter, around about April. Uh, Everton would get themselves safe and then the players would all knock off. And that was it. And happened that year, knocked off. We ended up, you know, finishing bad. And I think we lost five, one or five, nothing at, at, at Man City. And that was the only day I thought, my goodness, I could lose my job here because of what happened. So after that, I straightened that out and I made sure that we weren't going to finish. Uh, we weren't going to finish in that position again, and I wasn't going to allow what happened to happen again. And uh, to be fair, I got my chance to to do that. Did Rooney leaving have an effect? No, but it, I, I didn't say it would have effect, but it, because of his level of player, mm. but it brought me a bit of money in. But oh, we 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 fought we fought tooth and nail. We didn't want to let him go. You know, I tried everything, and you know, I had I'd met I'd met Alex a couple of times, and Chelsea were trying to get get Wayne in. There was talk about Newcastle. You remember Newcastle was trying to get Wayne as well, but Chelsea were trying to get him. We were getting pressured, and it was hard, and Wayne was wanted, and. And we'd done the deal. We actually played Man United. The night, the night Wayne signed for Man United, we were playing Man United. Uh, Bill Kenwright concluded the deal. And, and Bill was an emotional fellow. He was an actor as well. And uh, he shed a few tears that night because we were... No, we didn't want Wayne to go, but we knew we couldn't stop it. Did Alex get you a bottle of, a bottle of red to say thanks? Uh, no, I don't... I think he just... I think I, think I was, at that time, was... Uh, we had, I had bought a few players off him, like David Healy, where I go back to and we'd, in the club. So... I think Alec probably expected me to you sell all his best players. <laughs> 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 but the club finished fourth that season, brilliant, yeah. above Liverpool. Oh, How which, did you manage it? Uh, oh, it was it was great because probably the biggest thing what you had to do, Evan, you were always getting compared to Liverpool. And I remember we were you know, trying to buy, going back to buying players. I think we bought James Beatty that year. Remember we went to Southampton, we bought James Beatty for seven million maybe. Might have been we bought James Beatty or might have been might have been a bit more. I'm thinking, good, we've got a centre forward now. We need a new centre after Wayne had gone. Liverpool went and bought uh, Moriantis. Moriantis. Real Madrid. Oh, for Real Madrid, I was like, oh no, <laughs> here we go again. You know, I get, you know, every time I'm saying, hey, come on, I'm I'm going to. 
we were getting forward, but we were we were improving as a team. The whole thing was building, and uh, I've got to say that uh, that year, going back to we beat Man United one 0 in the running. We were we get we're getting above Liverpool. I think Andy Johnson scored a hat trick that year when we beat Liverpool three uh, 0 at, at Goodison, and then we had in the running we had to beat one of the big teams, and Duncan scores a, a header, uh, uh, but. Man United centre half at that time were off right in the Duncan because Duncan was awesome. Duncan scored the header. We beat them one 0 under the lights at Goodison, and it was it was raucous, and uh, and that was probably the result in the last three or four, which uh, got us into Europe. Were you a big manager for letting the boys celebrate and stuff like that? Aye, but you know I went I went lessons. Oh, I I was I was I was saying I was still a young manager, I'm still saying, I know what the players want, I know what they need, I know when they need the downtime, I know when they, I know when you, you have to hit them hard and, and uh, I used to hate it when players said they were tired, that meant the opposite to me, you know, so I'd probably work them harder if they said that, you know, that was just my mentality at the time, but uh, so we, anyway, we qualify for the Champions League and I remember, stupid things you do as a manager and you know, the sky cameras are around and I'm probably like this programme, what I'm doing <laughs> now and telling you all this. Uh, I'm sitting with a glass of champagne in my in my conservatory uh, in my house in Preston, sky cameras. Liverpool, I think, we're playing Newcastle. We're needing, we're needing Liverpool to lose a draw. I think the draw gets us quite... We had all arranged, if Liverpool don't win, we're all meeting in the blue bar in the, the blue bar down in the docks in Liverpool, or the team, mm -hmm. you know. Well, we're qualifying for the Champions League. Mm -hmm. You know, when you think, well, it's never been done. So, right enough, Liverpool draw, we're in the Champions League, sky cameras, I'm sitting there like a stupid bugger with a glass of champagne. And, <laughs> and, uh, but we're all meeting in the, sky, in the blue bar, Bye, I don't know, six o'clock. But we're playing Arsenal on the Tuesday night at Highbury. And I'm saying, I'm not really caring about the game because we've done what we've had to do. So the lesson I learned, we had a great night, as you can imagine, you know, we're all hugging and we're celebrating. We were playing Arsenal. We lose 7-1 at Highbury. <laughs> we lose 7-1 at Highbury on the Tuesday night. So there's lessons in the journey of being a manager and a coach you learn. That was one. But would I change it for that? Because Everton have never qualified for the Champions League. Look at how hard it is to qualify for the Champions League. Look at the money getting spent to qualify. So it was an incredible achievement, which I hope you actually asked, the, asked me the rest of it in a minute or two about the rest of it. Go on, it. you can go and tell us. Because, because, you're you're not, not, I don't even think because you need a you've not done your homework <laughs> on it. I don't think you even need no. a question. You're just going to tell us. So, come back to where it is. So anyway, Liverpool have only got to the Champions League final against AC Milan. <laughs> Oh, I remember that. I do. It is right. right. You've no right. They came down, back. They came back from three 0 uh, down. Don't, right? don't, 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 don't. <laughs> <laughs> so we're. Uh, so I remember we're in. I'd, I'm in the house and the, the Champions League finals on, and uh, one 0 AC Milan. My phone's going mad. Get in there. Get in. You know, all the Evertonians, all the kit men, all the everybody. Two 0 Get in there. Yes. You know, three 0 It's over now. You know what I mean. <laughs> Because only four teams could qualify for the Champions League. And we were always a bit worried, what if Liverpool won the Champions League? What's going to happen to us? You know, would they, would they, would they try and do something? And it was a concern, a wee bit of a concern. I'm saying, they can't do it. We finished fourth, you know, they can't do anything happen. Anyway, second half, 3 1, 3 2, 3 3. Oh, so I'm dying. Mm -hmm. So at the end of it, 4 3, Liverpool have won. No, I'm, I'm dead. So I'm on Skyscanner booking a flight out of the country. <laughs> I'm booking a flight. I says, there's no way I can stay here. No, Liverpool have won the Champions League. No way I can do this. So, right enough, I flew out the next morning. I couldn't, couldn't stand it because... And then what happens then is, I don't think UEFA were ready for five British teams being in the Champions League. And the winners were going to... They're saying the winners should be in the Champions League. So they did. They got, they got Liverpool in. They got us a... We got as a qualifier against the worst draw, which was yeah. Villarreal, who Rangers been. Villarreal had an unbelievable Raquel team. Me Raquel, like me, and all them. We are. Uh, we were. We legend though. Oh, I remember Mikel Arteta. We're all sitting in the dining room waiting, and the draw coming in. The draw came up, and it was Villarreal and Everton, and Mikel Arteta went, "Oh no!" So right away, I knew we were in. 
we were in for it. You know, it was a real, real unbelievable game. And and then we we uh, I think we lose at Goodison, and we go there. Uh, we go to Villarreal. Big Duncan scores with a minute to go to take it into extra time in the Champions League, and and uh, and the referee disallows it. Colina disallows the goal. So it was, in, un, and to this day we don't know how the goal was ever disallowed. Is so that one of the most frustrating? That was probably one, career, of, huh? probably one of the, the biggest nights where where we had because we'd gone to Villarreal, and Villarreal were a top team, and you no, know, ever we were. So. We uh, we get knocked out. We get knocked out, and I and I, I believe that really, at that time, you know, they didn't want five British teams in it, in it, and we didn't we didn't make it in shambles. So you're the man at Everton. Everyone loves you. When did you first get the call that Man United wanted to come and take you? Uh, end of April. Sir and Alex again. Sir Alex again, and the problem was is we were the year before we had finished above Liverpool in the Premier League. And we were neck and neck with Liverpool at the moment. And you might say not, but it was a big thing. You know, we were at this time we were we were sort of matching Liverpool stride by stride, getting above them. So I'd got a call from from Alex and I, and I went to his house. And I think people think that over the years that I, you know it was set up or something. And I keep saying it was never. And actually, I'll tell you why it was the end of April. It'd be my birthday, and uh, my wife had bought me a watch. And I went to we were in, and I had to change the strap or something at the time. So we were in. And uh, phone rang. I says, oh, I says, oh, it's, it's Alex. So I took it. He says, uh, where are you? I says, uh, I'm, I was actually over in Cheshire doing, I says, I'm, I can't remember, I was in uh, Wimslow or something, not near Wimslow. He says, where are you? I says, I, I says, uh, says uh, come to the house later. He say, I says, aye, I, I, okay. I, no, that's what you did when he called, as I said. I've got a pair of jeans on. I says, oh, no. I says, we were day off. I'd never go, I'd never turn up with a pair of jeans on to Sir Alex Ferguson, you know, or just the way I've sort of been brought up in the way, I wouldn't do that. I says, what am I going to do? I says, oh no, I says, well, nip to Marks and Spencer's and buy a pair of trousers, or what am I going to do, you know? So they were the things. So I dropped my wife off at the shopping centre, you know, and, uh, and I go and I had to get to the door. I says, sorry, Alex, I'm, I'm in my jeans, you know. So he says, I come on in, made me a cup of tea. And he's got, a, he's, got a, he's got a lovely big room with all his memorabilia and stuff and uh, took me up and he said, uh, he says, uh, he says, you're going to be the next Manchester United manager. I went, wow. And that was it. And, and uh, he says, I'm, I'm retiring. And he said, the, the biggest thing is, nobody's to know, can't tell MD. He says, tell your wife, he says, don't tell MD else. And I went out, I went, aye, ah, okay. So we so we talked for after that and right enough, he opened a bottle of red wine and with a with a couple of glasses of red wine. And we, we talked about the squad for about half an hour, an hour, and he said to me, he says, Come back tomorrow. He says, uh, the, the the people are coming to meet you tomorrow here in the house again. So that's what that's what I'd done. And the biggest thing was is I was more concerned in my head, I need to beat Liverpool. I need to finish above Liverpool in the Premier League. It was so important for me at Everton. And, I, and I'm worried, but we were only, I think we were three games to the end of the season. We, we did finish above Liverpool in the Premier League at that season. So that was the way, that was the way Alex, that, that was as simple as that, offered me the job and, and that was it. So you weren't even getting a chance to turn it down now? No, I never get a chance to say eh, no, or eh, by the way, what about this or that? He went through the squad and just eh, went on with it. So. That was exactly it. And maybe in hindsight, when I look back at it now, I think, well, maybe I should have needed, there needed to be much more sort of done and said, but why would there be? I trusted them and I didn't need to do any more than that. Was it hard not to tell anyone, eh? Oh, <laughs> see when I went back and told my wife in the shopping centre. And then I couldn't tell my kids. Couldn't tell my kids. Couldn't tell my dad. Couldn't tell MD. Because... The biggest thing was, Sir Alex, it wasn't that me getting the Man United job, it was Sir Alex was retiring. Mm. And I says, I can't say a thing, because if any way MD found out or got a bit of this, I says, I'm not taking nothing, nothing to do with this, you know, so uh, I, I generally couldn't tell MD. See, when you were at Everton, you seen Ferguson was obviously getting a bit older, did you, th did you think that's, that's the job for me? Come on, tell us the truth. I, I always thought I would have a chance, because Manchester United, what they stood for, Manchester United took... Manchester United didn't always take the most sexy manager on the, out there. Manchester United took what they saw was the most up-and-coming, 
uh, growing, getting in better, you know, the way they were, and tended to pick British as well. You know, you think when Sir Alex came for Aberdeen, from Aberdeen, you know, Alex had, had been really successful with you know, winning the, the Cup Winners' Cup and stuff like that, and done some great, great things. But you, you wouldn't have said he was maybe the most, the biggest manager out there. So I think Manchester United followed their, their philosophy at the time, and, uh, and that's where I think they went for what they saw as, as a, a British manager up and coming and, and sort of trying to get better. On reflection, how disappointed are you to only get nine or ten months? I'm really disappointed because I, I think there was, a, there was a big job to turn that around, which Alex had, had explained to me in, uh, over the meetings I had with him. But, you know, when you go to the big clubs, that's what's happening now. You've got to win. But going back, probably over all our conversation, you know, most of it has been in a way where, yeah, you can win or you can, you can lose and you can maybe not do quite so well and you get away with it. Uh, not now. I think at the big clubs, you, you know, you've got to really hit the ground running. You've got to win. We didn't win enough games, but... I've got to say, I think there's, I think there's a lot of mitigating circumstances for that. After a Man United job, you've had uh, Uno dos tres jobs after that. Oh come on, come on! <laughs> See, this is this is the sort of ridicule you get from media people like no, yourself. No, well, no, you're no. Well, you're trying to improve I mean, yourself. Ah, you, you. <laughs> uh, you know, you're trying to improve yourself. Probably one of my uh, Spain was great. Yeah. Uh, I've got to say, Spain, living in San Sebastian, La Liga. And you've got to say, very few British managers get offered the jobs now. We're, we're importing millions of them to take the jobs here, but we're not getting offered uh, many jobs ourselves abroad. So to get offered the job was, was really good. Is the language it. barrier hard to the players that uh, No, the, all the players spoke English. Oh, now. We right? had an interpreter as well. We've done, we done, uh, we done our, our lessons. We went to our lessons. And I've got to say, I loved it. And actually, I think as you get older, you do want to try and do other things as well. And learning Spanish was great. But I couldn't pick it up. And I'll tell you another thing is, if you're a full-time manager and intense and driven by it, then to fit in something else into your life, like learning a language, isn't that easy? Mm -hmm. You know, it sounds easy. Ah, I'll get up and I'll do it at six o'clock in the morning. Ah, no, I'll do it in the afternoon. It's not that easy. So learning it, I've got to say, I had learned a lot of it and I had got much better. I could understand it. But I think it would have taken me another year to be able to speak it fluently. And I think by the end, they can use it a wee bit as an excuse. But I actually think now, for example, like, the SFA Pro Licence, for example, is now asking the, the, the members who are doing it to present one of their, their things in a, in a foreign language. I think it's a brilliant oh, thing. Yeah, yeah. No, because I think now for Scottish coaches and Scottish managers, you know, you're, you're going to have to open your horizons. You know, you know, you, whether you do it in Spanish or German or French or whatever you choose to, to do it in, uh, I, I think it's, it's important. And I think that it will be a disappointment for me going forward that I didn't learn it. But I've got to say, I think I needed longer. It wasn't that I wasn't going to get, be able to do it. I think it was just needed longer time. Just on something else, I don't think you get the credit you deserve. 150 games won in the Premier League, won only four managers. That must make you so so mm. proud. It does, aye. And it does. And sometimes it goes it goes amiss. Sometimes you think that, ah, you've not really done that much. But we had, I think there was only three years out of 11 we didn't qualify for the uh, being the top eight in the Premier League. You look at it now, the scramble to try and get into the top eight. We've done it every year now. You could say it's changing. You know, Man United, yeah, even that year, you know, it wasn't the best, but we got to the quarter-final of the Champions League, we got to the semi-final of the League Cup losing penalties. So we had, there was lots of other good things. Last year at West Ham, we done unbelievably well yeah, to, to, for the job we had in, in winning the games. And, and even when we went to, to Real Sociedad, we were in relegation trouble, had to get them out of trouble and, and things like that. So the only disappointment was probably a period at Sunderland, but overall we've had... We've had really good success and, and I'm glad you've mentioned the, the number of wins. Uh -huh. Is this the hardest time to be a manager since you've started the I think it's hard because there's so many other things. I think the, the owners have changed the, the landscape. Obviously the money's changed the landscape. Uh, but I think, you know, I think been in, I don't think you can be in it long now. I think the job's really demanding. I think that it's much harder to, to say manage like I did for Everton for 11 and a half years. I don't know if you'll get managers staying in the jobs that long uh, ever again. You know, prior to that, the only people who stayed in the jobs, Sir Bobby Robson, I think, done it at Ipswich. Uh, uh, Brian Clough done it at Knott's Forest. Obviously, Sir Alex, Arsene Wenger. You know, there's not many managers who, who are able to stay in jobs for, say, 10, 11 years now. When you ask, because it's always brought up, would you be interested, Celtic, Rangers, Scotland, coming yeah. back up here? You would? I would be, aye. aye I would be. I've been, look, I've been close to a few of them once or twice and, and thought about it a lot. I would be. Uh, it's my home and it's, you know, 
where I come from and I'd like to come back and do it sometime. But I still, while, while I've got to say the Premier League's so strong, you know, I think that's probably would still remain my interest if it, if it can stay that way. David, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks very much. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Thank Cheers. You. Cheers.